Hey this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science a podcast for data science enthusiasts where i interview practitioners researchers and calculators about their journey experience and talk all things about data science I'm holding my Kaggle cup. Did you notice? You should be watching the video if you didn't. Welcome to Chai with great leaders, great founders, CTDS Dot Show. In this episode, I interview Bar Moses, who's the CEO and co-founder of Monte Carlo Data. Monte Carlo Data is trying to solve a problem that I think is one of the steps that appears even before the first step of the data science problem, as we try to formulate it, which is looking at the data. and looking at the reliability of it or the downtime of it all the issues that we face with data that we have to deal with afterwards and more than that so if you're interested to know more about that please keep listening to this one we talk a lot about data downtime data observability and all of the issues that originate out of having bad data or having the issues with data that is coming in from different sources Bar has had an interesting background. She started her journey by serving in the Israeli Air Force. We talk about her journey there to transitioning into math, studying math at Stanford, and eventually into the world of startups and data. This interview is filled with nuggets about issues that we face with data and advices for people in the startup world. So, without further ado, here is one of the most interesting conversations around this topic. Please enjoy the show. I'm on the call with Bar Moses. Bar, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, usually, I start by talking about my hero's journey, and I know you've had a very interesting and uh, varied background. At one point in time, you were leading the Israeli air forces, and you were leading their data intelligence unit. Can you tell uh, what tasks were you working on? I'm sure most of it would be top secret, but whatever you're allowed to speak about. Yeah, happy to um, happy to share a little bit about that. Um, so yeah, I was um, I was born and raised in Israel. Um, I was born and raised in uh, the Weizmann. I grew up in the Weizmann Institute of Science. Um, so I actually grew up sort of on a university grounds. Um, uh, you know, as a kid, sort of grew up doing experiments in in um, in my dad's lab. Uh, my dad is a physics professor, um, so try to I try to blow up things um, in his <laughs> lab as a kid, <laughs> sometimes unsuccessfully, um, and 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 solve physics problems with him uh, if you know. Uh, We got a chance, and um, yeah, you know, um, after high school, I was drafted to the Israeli Air Force, um, and um, you know, in, in Israel, uh, that's sort of a, a common thing to to join um, to join the military, um, and you know, sort of my my role at that age, you know, I was um, about 18 years old, um, and and um, uh, I was responsible for uh, sort of a a unit of um, uh, um, uh, sort of data analysts. Um, and you know, sort of at that young age, you 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 know, you obviously don't have any formal training, right? I didn't study in the university yet, um, didn't have sort of any professional experience, let alone management training. Um, and so, at a very young age, you're given a tremendous amount of responsibility. Um, uh, you know, can't, can't share too much about sort of the work that we did, but um, you know, a lot of that had to do with um, sort of data that that ultimately helped save lives. Um, and um, actually, we we actually got commended with an award for outstanding performance during that time. Um, and some of the things that I learned there, are sort of around um, you know diligence, not only with leadership but also with data, um, and the importance of that. Um, and also about sort of working working with people in environments where um, you know I really believe that if you give folks the opportunity to make an impact. And if they have the right motivation, even if um, you know they don't have sort of the the perfect background or skill set or sort of you know many many years of training in a particular area, they can still do great things, even if they've never sort of done it before. Um, and so um, you know, really sort of was 
uh, learned a lot and, and really shaped how I think about sort of team dynamics and, and leadership later on in my life during that period of time. that definitely sounds a lot of fun especially at that age i i read or i might have heard somewhere that you used to wake up at 4 am uh, military schedules are tight uh, for exercise and you were also working on these data problems do you think all of that was helpful in your current leadership roles uh, do you, do you connect the dots yeah i i definitely don't wake up at 4 am anymore <laughs> um i actually love sleeping um <laughs> but um but yes i think you know learning from a young age about um rigor and the importance of hard work um and of diligence and what you can do together sort of as a camaraderie as a team um definitely helped and shaped and and impact um you know i i i wish i could still do uh sit ups and push ups at 4 a.m. maybe that's a good goal for for next year <laughs> um but uh yeah and i i also believe a lot sort of in um you know kind of creating the right environment to solve hard problems um and you know i think in a way um you know when you're in a startup you're sort of uh running a marathon and a sprint at the same time um Absolutely. and so uh yeah balancing that um and also balancing you know obviously kind of the um uh sort of the health of your team and and all that is is super super important we'll just dive into that but there's another dot that i want to connect before that uh, i read yeah. that you transitioned into studying math and then leading a data analytics team at gainsight uh, what got you interested in math was it uh, the work from before or, or were you always driven to math great question um so one of the the things that i loved about stanford was that um uh you know going to stanford i remember it felt a little bit like i just arrived at disneyland but for my brain in a way you know there were all these different um you know there was like that sort of a uh, roller coaster and that kind of train to try out and for all these things that were just very stimulating for um you know kind of um uh, different um yeah different academic avenues that that I was really curious about um and I really enjoyed that and I enjoyed that the ability to try out different um types of classes and courses and was super fortunate to have the opportunity to to do that and so I actually did a bunch of different um kind of classes the first the first year or so and was really drawn um to math it was super hard for me um but i i actually loved that it was hard too um uh and so uh yeah i ended up sort of taking um actually studying uh, mathematics and computational sciences is sort of a combination of of math and stats and um yeah i loved every minute uh loved every minute of it for sure um and after transitioning into gainsight i read that uh, you also transitioned into the startup world you were a mentor at first round capital uh, were, were you also driven to building your own business from the beginning or was this also a natural transition that happened yeah you know it definitely wasn't it actually wasn't on my radar until until way later um so after stanford um you know i i uh, worked for a little bit at the stats department um there and then was actually a consultant um at Bain and Company where I worked um on a number of different projects um among them for example um with the data science team helping fortune 500 companies on sort of their st- data strategy and operations um and a lot of that work was actually making decisions based on very limited data uh because oftentimes in business and in startups um you actually don't have sufficient data and you still need to make decisions and move forward um and so you know learned a lot about sort of that process and what that you know what kind of data can you actually collect what data is available for companies and what do you do when you don't have the data that you need um and uh you know really enjoyed that time later on joined gainsight um where um you know had had sort of the, the fortunate of um kind of being part of the of the growth story of um of gainsight and the customer success category um and also built a number of teams internally one of them was sort of our customer data team um which we called gainsight on gainsight because we were basically running gainsight internally to um uh for gainsight so we called it gong for short mm. um uh, kind of like our, our sort of like dog food or drinking our own champagne instance um and so in sort of uh you know leading that team um one of the things that we did was we actually we kind of built like an incubator to test out lots of ideas um uh and you know sort of the ideas that worked really well we could sort of implement them both internally and kind of you know help our customers adopt them 
Um, and, you know, the ideas that, you know, sucked, you know, everybody hated me for them and, and we moved on. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I think for during that time at Gates, I learned, learned a lot about sort of building a company, um, a lot about sort of operations and scale. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, I probably only at that time or sort of at the end of that time actually started thinking about sort of starting a company. And that definitely came from sort of the pain that I saw working with um, Gainsight sort of customers and, and internally. So I would say sort of the desire to start the company really came from, from the desire to solve that problem um, versus kind of like starting a company uh, for, for the sake of it. I, I was really, I was, it really bothered me that sort of a solution to this problem didn't exist. <laughs> That makes sense. Well, one of the career advices that I've been given is to join a startup uh, early in my career. Do you think that was uh, th that's a good advice? In hindsight, it looks like uh, Gainsight also functioned like a startup, if I may. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, you know, join Gainsight. I think at the time that I was there, you know, our, we grew a revenue about uh, 10x or so in, in the three and a half years that I was there. Um, so, so definitely, definitely was in a fast growth startup motion. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, early in your career, career, there's sort of, I think there's two things that impact you. One, your ability to learn by seeing other people who are really good at what they're doing. Um, and two, your ability to actually experiment with doing those things yourself and building them yourself. And I feel very fortunate to have had the opportunity to do both of those things um, at Gainsight. I learned a ton from the leadership. Um, my boss, Allison Pickens, and um, our CEO, Nick Mehta, the entire leadership uh, team there, um, just learned a lot about them as sort of, you know, um, professional operators. Um, and, and also got the great opportunity to work on a variety of different, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, problems. Um, and throughout that, sort of the, the you know, how do we, how do we bring data to the customer success space? And, you know, how do we bring data that's sort of trusted and accurate and reliable kept on coming up? Um, but as someone, you know, as a, as a founder today, I draw a lot on my experiences and, and sort of what I learned at Gainsight and, you know, ask myself, like, what would we have done, um, you know, in that situation? And, um, you know, and, and, and try to learn as much from, from as many companies out there um, in general, right? Because uh, there are very, very many good um, examples of companies in, in the data space and in general, we're sort of charting new territories um, and creating new categories and bringing on totally new technologies. Um, and so I'm really excited about the many new um, strong examples that have emerged in the last, honestly, like five years or so in, in the data space, including folks like, um, you know, Tableau and Looker, their bigger, bigger acquisitions a few years ago and Snowflake, which is, you know, sort of the the most successful software IPO of all times. Um, it's pretty cool that it's a data company that sort of in, in that position. Definitely. And lingering on to my previous question, it also seems like, uh, at least in my opinion, in a startup where the boundaries are blurred between teams, it's easier to work on multiple projects. And also, especially in a customer facing role, you have to talk to the engineering team. You have to talk to everyone. It's, it's easier to do that in a startup, in my opinion. Right. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, well, um, so it, it, for, it's definitely interesting when, when the company is smaller, right? It's also, it's also um, or sorry, it's definitely easier when the company is smaller because you could just like, you know, tap someone on the shoulder. That's sort of yeah. the example that I used to give back when we could tap people on their shoulder, right? Um, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Whose shoulder are you tapping? Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, that being said, actually, interestingly, at Gainsight, we were, we at some point moved to sort of a remote first or sort of distributed a first company. And so actually my, my team and I work with folks across, you know, um, you know, various locations in, in the United States, um, San Francisco, St. Louis, a um, bunch of other sort of uh, remote locations. And then um, as well as India, actually. So Hyderabad and Bangalore, in particular, we had teams there. Um, later on, um, had teams in Israel as well. And so actually having to figure out how to collaborate in a startup in early days in a remote um, uh, sort of location or remote setting is something that um, I've learned a lot from, from doing at Gainsight. And then in starting Monte Carlo, we actually started the company remote first, even before sort of um, COVID-19. And so we developed a lot of 
um, some of the sort of cultural things and process things that helps us from day one. So just as an example, we sort of do, you know, these um, uh, kind of like uh, team, uh, team events sort of once a month where we come together and sometimes like we have a magician come in and do tr magic tricks for us. Or yesterday we had, you know, a session about like joy and mindfulness in your life. Um, and so from very, very early on, we've invested a lot in creating a culture that respects um, remote and diversity and just creates a strong foundation, you know, hopefully for, for, future, for future years. And uh, if the audience is curious about this important topic, I was just listening to Monte Carlo's YouTube channel. Uh, I, I believe you've given a few talks that are up on there about specifically this theme. Yeah, I think um, many, many companies out there are thinking through like, what is our, you know, remote uh, or distributed um, uh, philosophy as a company? You know, will we ever go back to, to being in person? Um, and if not, what does that look like? And actually, interestingly, I'm seeing people across the gamut. So I think there are some companies and founders who are, you know, really sort of um, bullish on in person and getting back as, as soon as possible. And then, I, you know, and then the other extreme, there's founders or, or um, folks who really sort of believe in, in sort of this remote distributed uh, world. And then there's folks in the middle who want to offer sort of the best of both worlds. Um, I think for us, you know, when it's safe to reopen, obviously sort of the safety and health um, uh, of our, our team is above all and their families. Um, but, you know, once it's sort of safe to open, I think we want to create a place where, um, you know, we can build the company around the people versus the people around the company, if that makes sense. So I really believe in sort of hiring the best people wherever they are and setting up the best um, uh, sort of optimal office environment for them, whether that's like helping them find people locally to connect with um, uh, or creating a great online sort of remote experience for everyone. I am sure the audience listening right now is ho hoping that the world eventually transitions into such a philosophy and such a thinking. Um, so I, transitioning into Monte Carlo data, I actually have the website open in the background for the people that actually watch the video. I know it's a few of you, but still. Uh, the main theme that comes out on your website is data reliability delivered and the website for the audience is montecarlodata.com. Can you tell us uh, the vision of the company and what led you to founding uh, this company? Yeah, definitely. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, um, by the way, the website is montecarlodata.com in case anyone wants to check it out um, as we speak. But um, <laughs> the, uh, as I mentioned, you know, when, when I was at, um, when I was at Gainsight, um, uh, I was sort of in, responsible internally for um, the team that mentioned sort of Gong, uh, Gainsight on Gainsight. Um, and we were sort of responsible for delivering data that was really important for decision making. This was back in 2016. Um, and this is something that I see happen in, in many, many companies when, you know, there's sort of a need across the company to become data driven. And then a couple of things happen. First, you start relying on many more sources of data. Um, two, you start having more people in the organizations who are actually looking at data and at reports and making decisions based on it, um, which is great. And is part of sort of the vision for a data-driven world, right? The hard thing about that is that um, the importance of trust in the data and the accuracy and availability of the data really matters. So if before you could have, you know, the data being delivered on time, you know, maybe like on a monthly basis or something, now you need the data to be delivered on time whenever people are looking at the reports. Um, and, you know, for us, we like our, our data wasn't set up for that. And so bad data, you know, was something that we were struggling with. Um, and, you know, I would sort of uh, wake up, you know, the night before an important meeting, worrying about whether the report that we're going to show is accurate or not and sweating on my way to the office and, you know, <laughs> we're ref hitting refresh, you know, until the very last minute, hoping that the numbers stay the same and nothing change. And, um, you know, I remember this particular weekend that suddenly, of course, it's always on the weekend, right? It's like a Friday, yeah. 8 p.m. Uh, when you like get the notification that like the numbers are all wrong. Um, and I remember this weekend, I was like, how is it that like, you know, um, that we're struggling with these issues that like data is not showing up or it's showing up partially or, you know, sort of folks looking at reports and the numbers don't quite look right and they're not sure why, like, and why are we always the last people to find out about these issues, right? We're always hearing about it from our downstream consumers, um, you know, whether it's uh, sort of our CEO or internal consumers. 
Um, and I was like, you know, what, like, it just seems crazy to me. How is it that we are the last to know about this? Hmm. Why are we sort of sweating at, at night? Um, and it got me thinking, so like, is it, is it just me? Like, am I crazy? Or like, what, are, what am I doing wrong, right? <laughs> Um, and so I actually talked to sort of, you know, uh, Lior, who's my co-founder today and asked many people in my network, um, and, and actually just like started talking with like very many people, um, actually ended up talking to sort of hundreds of data leaders from small, you know, sort of 10 people startups to large organizations like Netflix and Uber, um, cold call people and just ask them like, what's top of mind for you? What's kind of like keeping you up at night? What are you sweating up at night at, at, at 3 a.m.? Um, and, you know, I, I did that because I wanted some validation to make sure that it's not just kind of my personal experience, right? Like everyone sort of has their scars on their back, so to speak. Um, and I want to understand what the market looks like. And I actually learned that this was a huge problem. One, it was top of mind for so many data leaders. It's like the thing that sort of comes to mind as like the thing that gets them incredibly worried. And two, I learned that the impact on companies is huge. Like com companies were literally losing you know, millions of dollars because of this problem, um, oftentimes because it was just an all too common reality that people were just accepting it as like, oh yeah, you know, our data is bad. You know, we just typically have like lots of people look at it before the data goes out or something like that. Um, and so that sort of gave me the conviction that, you know, one, th the market is big. I think every company is becoming a data-driven company today. And when you are becoming, when you become data-driven, you will run into this problem of how do I know the data is trusted and accurate? Um, and you know what, if they haven't run into it, they will at some point soon, um, which, you know, any person in the data sort of industry can tell you um, that they've experienced something like this. And then the second thing is that I think it's still an unsolved problem and it's very painful to people. And it's one that, that people want to see resolved. Um, and so that was sort of my personal journey of both kind of experiencing it firsthand for me, but also doing this external validation to make sure that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really sort of a, a problem so much so that I really, I was like thinking to myself, I can't imagine the world in five or 10 years from today without a solution to this. Like we have to be crazy, you know, to be operating in, in this way. The, the fear definitely comes through in your blog post, most of which, uh, some of which start by mentioning at 3 a.m. You will get this call. Most of us end up getting that call because of these issues, at least people who work in this domain. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and by the way, just to be clear, like, I think that's a terrible reality, right? Like the reality in which we live, in which, um, you know, we, we have to, you know, we're, we're forced to yeah. do a lot of these things manually, which requires all this like hard work, I think it's completely unnecessary, right? I think we need to lean into the solution into automation to, to make sure that, you know, that is never a reality that anyone deals with. And so the mission and vision for Monte Carlo is like, have your data be reliable and never experience that again, right? That's something that we should all aspire to sleep well at night, um, <laughs> knowing that your data can be trusted and accurate, right? Absolutely. And uh, as you mentioned, I, I'm sure you've done the market research, but to help us appreciate uh, what industries are you aiming for? Uh, we, we look at, some of us look at data problems like, all right, you have the CSV on your machine. You just need to be able to make some interesting predictions around it. You can do EDA. You don't need online learning. Uh, you don't have an incoming stream of data. So what's, what's the target industry for you? And uh, how important of a problem is this that you're trying to solve? Yeah. So, you know, I think um, it, it's a good question because I think when we say, you know, an industry or a company is data driven, it can be any way, anywhere from a company that, to your point, you know, um, starts with just having Excel and, and, you know, or maybe like a CSV file. And, um, you know, they're, they're sort of doing kind of rudimentary or sort of basic analysis. Um, and it can be all the way to sort of organizations that have you know, thousands or 10,000s of data sources that they're bringing together, you know, multiple data warehouses, data lakes, et cetera, multiple BI solutions. Um, and so you can, you really see kind of the whole gamut, um, right, and today. And, and I think more and more companies are moving to a place where um, you need to have that infrastructure and, and, you know, you relying more and more on data and leaning into that. Um, and I think we see that sort of varying a little bit by industry and by use case. 
Um, you know, for us, the companies that we work with actually span very different industries. Um, you can see it on our website too, but it's companies all the way from um, Eventbrite um, to uh, MindBody to Compass um, to even um, Hippo, uh, which is in the insure tech uh, business. And so you can see kind of the wide variety of, of industries there. Um, anywhere from kind of e-commerce to um, uh, marketplaces to even B2B. Um, and so for us, what's or kind of what sort of is important today is that you actually use data for either decision making or uh, in your product, um, you know, that, that you're actually sort of truly data driven as a company. Um, I do think that if you think about the data industry at large, Data downtime, in my opinion, is probably like one of the top three most important, if not the most important problem that we're going to face as an industry. Because if you look at it, we sort of figured out how to collect data, how to store data, how to process data. We did not figure out how to make sure that your data is actually accurate. Um, I can't say that like that is a solved problem. So I actually think this is going to be huge for the data industry overall and, and for really any company um, uh, in the same way that, you know, any sort of engineering team um, you know, sort of has, runs into some of these problems, any data team, I think, will run into these problems, um, for sure. Absolutely. And uh, in your blog post, which are there on the website as well, and on Bar's Medium profile as well, in one of them, you mentioned that uh, if you're scrolling through an app, sometimes we t tend to just hand wave that, okay, maybe it's our internet, maybe it's not good enough, maybe the app isn't refreshing. But that is, uh, me, sometimes the data is down. So what, what do you mean by data downtime? What, what does that mean? Yeah, great question. Um, so, so data downtime as a as sort of definition um, is periods of time when data is missing, inaccurate, or otherwise erroneous. That's sort of the kind of like the proper definition that we sort of came up with. But where does it come from, right? Why data downtime? Um, this actually sort of drives or kind of builds on um, a corollary to application downtime, um, right? So if you think about it, a couple of decades ago, um, you know, Monte Carlo as a company probably didn't even have a website. Um, companies largely were, you know, probably didn't have a website at all. Um, and so if your website was down for whatever reason, um, honestly, probably nobody noticed because like mm -hmm. it just wasn't a big deal. Nobody was using your website and they could just move on, right? But today, that seems ridiculous, right? People are like, you know, it's just, it's, uh, it's kind of crazy to think that, right? You're kind of managing 99.999% of availability for your applications overall. And of course, if your website is down, that's huge. Um, and, you know, uh, there was sort of this instance where um, actually like Netflix, I think a few years ago, um, you know, their web, the website or the app was down for like 45 minutes, which like was hugely detrimental. Um, I can share the link to that talk after this, after this podcast as well. But, you know, the, 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 it's clear today that the impact of your applications being down are very severe. Um, and so because of that, there's this whole, um, you know, sort of category of solutions that emerge to help make sure that your apps are, app, are up and running and there's no dying, downtime for them. Um, I view as I view data being wrong as the same sort of corollary to that. Ten years ago, you had some data somewhere in your company, and maybe just a handful of people were using it. And so, if it was wrong, honestly, it wasn't a big deal because it wasn't driving any big decisions, right? Like maybe some people were looking at it, and maybe they were looking at it like once a quarter. So they had the entire quarter to actually make sure that that data is accurate, right? Um, but today, that's not the case. Today, everybody's using data way more frequently, way more in real time. And so in those instances, like when, you're, when your data is down, right? When it's, it's, when it's bad, when it's like not arriving in time, when it's, um, you know, sort of all null values suddenly, um, you know, when, when sort of it changes dramatically and you don't know about it um, uh, and, and, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't uh, be in, in this quality, people start noticing. And so I think in the same way that we've sort of figured out the application downtime problem in the last couple of decades, we're going to need to figure out the data downtime problem in this decade um, and actually make sure that we are uh, meticulously solving this problem in the same way that we did and that we're measuring, you know, 99.999, um, you know, five nines or four nines of sort of data uptime, if you will. Um, and, and I also believe that the solution to that will come from some of the principles that exist in software engineering that we can adopt in data. And uh, to, to elaborate on that, it's not just uh, companies or businesses as well. Uh, 
even as individuals uh, just just thinking out loud here we use yeah. uh, fitness trackers and what not and we're also looking sc- scrutinizing our data literally people look at their instagram likes for whatever reason that is also data that you're looking at and you don't want uh, that to be bad yeah 100% it's it's actually it's actually very personal um you know the the problem of data downtime i i recently wrote, wrote a blog post about this Data downtime is anywhere from, you know, can happen for anywhere for like a poker player to, um, you know, on you're right on your Fitbit, um, on on health uh, tracking applications, right? Um, uh, whether it's like, you know, monitoring your like, you know, blood, sugar levels in your blood or or anything like that, um, and and all the way to actually the election results, um, right? Um, and and uh, it, it just it, it impacts everyone. Um, you know, just to give a specific example, I think in the, the most recent sort of census, um, 2020 census was sort of plagued with, with bad data and, and data downtime. And, and that's impacting everyone um, personally. And so, yeah, I think this is, it's not, it's really not a theoretical problem. It's something very, very real and, and near and dear to everyone's heart, um, for sure. How do you look at uh, this? So earlier mentioned automation as, as part of the process. Uh, it's maybe to some extent comparable to devops uh, in the software 1.0 pipeline how how do you think of this as a solution how does it fit into the software 2.0 uh, world and if you could also maybe share a bit about your product because on the website uh, there's an option to join the waitlist for anyone that's listening uh, but if you could give us a teaser or maybe give us an insider look absolutely um so i'll go back to the analogy about application downtime and if you think about sort of how you know, application downtime was sort of resolved or sort of what are the tools, methodologies that we've developed to um, manage that is through, you know, teams like DevOps in particular, which we've really seen the rise of in the last decade um, and observability. Observability is sort of a space that has emerged as a very fast growing area to support DevOps teams to help them manage downtime for applications, right? Um, Now, if you think about kind of what observability means, observability is basically sort of the kind of ability to understand the health of a system based on, um, you know, sort of its output or based on sort of checks for it or or monitors for it. Um, And in the space of DevOps, you know, teams have uh, specific metrics that they look at, um, even though kind of applications can break for a million different reasons, right? There's so many different reasons why your website can be down, right? All the way from like someone making a change somewhere that you were not aware of, to like some network issue. Like there's a whole gamut of reasons why your app can be down. However, observability and sort of DevOps includes very specific metrics, including things like latency and performance and CPU and specific SLAs and SLOs and all this good like methodology that's like super common today in DevOps um, that folks use in order to uh, to have really good visibility into the health of their applications. And that's also driven by kind of this move, um, um, you know, from sort of monolith to microservices. Um, and so when you think about kind of that whole, uh, you know, change that happened in the recent, in their last generation and apply that to data, that's where I think sort of the solution to, to data downtime comes from. Um, and so I believe in something that we call data observability. And data observability in the same way is an organization's ability to understand the health of the data in their system and can give people the ability to eliminate data downtime by basically applying these best practices. Um, And part of that means thinking about um, downtime holistically, sort of across your data stack, right? So in the same way that, you know, um, if you think about sort of common solutions in the DevOps space or solutions like New Relic, AppDynamic, Splunk, PagerDuty, all of those are sort of best in class solutions to help engineers um, get sort of visibility into the health of their applications. Um, and you really can't imagine an engineering team sort of uh, operating without something like that, right? It would be really weird if anyone tried to like, you know, build sort of massive applications without that. However, in data, interestingly, we are doing that. We're actually flying blind. Um, we really have the you know, very complicated infrastructure and tech stacks, but we have no way to understand the health of them and to understand the observability of, or kind of you know, get insight into our, into our data observability. Um, and so, uh, you know, when you think about how data downtime can actually happen anywhere sort of across sort of your pipeline, all the way from ingestion to ETL to warehouse analytics in the same way that you, you know, kind of 
um, use New Relic Wrap Dynamics to manage your applications um, kind of wherever they are, connect to them. Um, I think the solution to data downtime ultimately is sort of doing the same in, in, in that kind of same approach, that same vein, providing um, uh, a health or sort of a view into the health of, of people's data. Um, now, what does data observability actually include? Um, there's sort of five key pillars and happy to elaborate on that um, as well. But that was also something that we sort of had to define, like what does data observability actually mean and, and what are those metrics? Um, but I'll just pause there kind of to see if like that corollary makes sense between sort of the observ observability sort of in DevOps and kind of observability in data. It does. Uh, to me, it also sounds like you're talking about looking at metadata of the incoming data before you actually start performing uh, analysis on it. Yeah, metadata is, is a huge part of it for sure. Um, you know, I think I think the ability to learn information about your data um, as much as possible. You know, oftentimes there are certain things where um, you know actually the answer is in the data already, um, and sort of we might resort to sort of asking someone or trying to do this in in a manual way. But you know, if we can if we can actually sort of lean on um, what the data is already telling us, um, that that can be. Uh, very powerful in bringing automation um, and, and saving a lot of sort of hard work and manual work for for teams. Just just continuing on that tangent, it's also really interesting because uh, many many times we're taught that you need to investigate the data once you have it to look at uh, are the columns right, are, are the values missing, instead of trying to solve the problem before. Just like you mentioned that we have these complicated stacks, we have these complicated open source libraries, but we aren't looking at the source, which should be the first case. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think when I think about how to sort of what, or what our approach is to sort of solution like this, there's sort of a few components, some we've talked about and some you just touched on. So one of them is kind of having, you know, end to end visibility into your existing stack. Right. So something that basically can connect quickly and seamlessly all the way from ingestion to analytics and doesn't actually require you to change your pipelines or write new code or like use a particular programming language. Right. Like there's so much um, diversity and complexity out there, a solution like this should work with your um, stack as is, that's one. Um, second, it should, I think, monitor your data sort of at rest, right? It shouldn't require actually taking the data outside um, from, from storage um, uh, in order to sort of enable uh, that kind of like observability. Um, and I think to, to your point, it should, it should um, prevent issues from happening in the first place by sharing information about like metadata or just data assets in general so that changes and modifications can be made by teams in a responsible way, right? So that, you know, if for example, you know, I'm sort of an engineer or a data engineer who wants like make a change in a pipeline somewhere, I am actually aware of all the upstream and downstream dependencies as well as kind of key information about the data asset that I'm working with so that when I'm making changes to it, um, I'm, I'm actually sort of aware of the, the surroundings and, and can prevent some of these fire drills from happening um, in the first place. And uh, just dropping another plug, many people who listen to this podcast, I'm sure they know that I'm not uh, very aware of these side of the things. So because if I sound smart, that's because I've read almost all of the blog posts that are there on your website would highly <laughs> encourage the people to check them out. But go <laughs> Going back to the previous discussion, you were talking about the five pillars of uh, data reliability. Please, please continue on that. Yeah, of course. So, so as I mentioned, you know, um, in in for observability for engineering, it's very clear what is included in there, and you know, it's it's quite common knowledge today. In data observability, it's not defined quite yet. Um, we're getting there, but um, you know, the the way that sort of we see that is that in order to get real of uh, you know real view into the health of your data, you need to cover sort of five key areas. Um, the five of is freshness, volume, um, schema, distribution, and lineage. I'll walk through each. So, freshness is sort of speaks to everything around sort of the timeliness and availability of the data. So for example, if a specific table gets updated like five times an hour, and then tomorrow it's like suddenly doesn't get updated, like that's obviously a problem, right? Um, so many different ways to think about sort of the freshness and up-to-dateness, if you will, of, of your data. Um, the second core pillar is volume. 
Uh, that, that one is pretty straightforward. But basically, you know, if expected to get, you know, sort of a 200 million rows and then suddenly I'm getting 5 million rows or just five rows, um, you know, obviously there, there's something that, that I want to look into. But making sure that sort of all of your data has, has made it. Um, oftentimes with something that we see is kind of a silent error where, you know, a job gets completed. So, you know, sort of it's all green, no error comes up. But, you know, the data arrived, only a third of the data has arrived or, or just like 10% of the data has arrived. Right? Well, sometimes you um, get large AWS bills as well if, if too much of it came in. That's true. You can see it in your AWS bills. <laughs> I would argue that that's a little bit too late after you were always <laughs> already charged. <laughs> that's you know, but, but that's, a, that's exactly the point, right? Like you will find out about that from your AWS bill or from a customer or some consumer downstream that's like, hey man, like what happened to the data? I, you know, the, or the numbers like look wild off, right? But isn't it crazy that you need something like your Amazon, like your AWS bill or like a customer in order to learn that? You should actually know that in near real time, right? Um, yeah. Because we can, right? Um, it's a, such a great example. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so the third pillar is schema. Um, and so basically schema speaks to sort of any changes in kind of the organization of your data whether that's like, for example, a field that's dropped or removed or even changed like from a string to an integer or something like that. Um, oftentimes we see that those are actually like culprits of sort of bad data. Like someone makes a change somewhere um, and you know, that sort of has um, kind of unknown implications or sort of implications downstream that, that are caught only later. Um, the fourth pillar is, is distribution. Um, and distribution sort of includes sort of a whole slew of metrics at the looking at the field level um, so I'll just give like a very simple example. If you're tracking, if you're a retail shop and you're tracking sort of, um, um, you know, uh, shirt size or something like that or shoe sizes and, you know, you expect to get sizes of between, you know, sort of two and 20 um, and suddenly you get like 40, right? That's sort of a, that's a value that you really, you know, didn't think that you'd ever see, um, yeah. right? And so that is um, uh, obviously sort of a, something that you'd want to be aware of. Um, and that can include many other things sort of in that, uh, in that kind of bucket. Um, and then the last is sort of lineage. And lineage actually helps us tee up all of this together. So lineage can help us sort of tell the story, if you will, of, um, of sort of a, of a data downtime incident. So it could be, you know, a freshness problem that's related to a volume problem downstream that's related to a distribution problem, you know, a few transformations down. So lineage really sort of helps us piece together um, you know, all the upstream and downstream dependencies of an asset um, and, and figure out sort of what are kind of, you can think of this like red, yellow, green, what are the different problems along the chain? Um, and so these five pillars, if you actually instrument your, your, your tech stack, uh, monitor and track these five pillars, um, you know, have the right kind of understanding of, of, of the analysis of these five pillars so it can actually generate and glean insights from them um, and sort of improve these over time, these, all of these together can actually bring you confidence and visibility into the health of your data and know that you will be the first to know when data is wrong. You're gonna know, you're gonna, you're gonna email AWS and tell them to, to reduce your bill because you know that that was incorrect. <laughs> And it, it also sounds like uh, maybe we're looking at the problem in a wrong way because uh, as data scientists, we have to deal with outliers. We have to deal with, uh, sometimes we think of maybe my internet's not working right. That's why the weather predictions of maybe it's the data we don't know. So uh, it also sounds like we have to uh, rephrase our perspective on the problems as well if we, if we look at it from this lens. A hundred percent. I totally agree. I think it's really a, a lot of change and shift in, how we think about things. You know, I think, um, you know, the best practice that I used to have when I did this was like, look, before every kind of important report, you know, we just assume that there are some problems. You're right. Maybe the weather changed. I don't know, maybe something like something happened and, you know, the data was the data just, you know, there was a data downtime and is, issue. Um, and, you know, in order to, to deal with that, we basically honestly like threw people at the problem and we were like, look, let's just have like six set of eyes go over every report. And I still see people like saying like, oh yeah, you know, we just have this system where like we need three or four different people to sign off on, on a report. Um, and I think that's fine. You know, I, I did that too, but I don't think that's going to work if we're really going to become data driven as organizations. Like if, when you have like, you know, um, uh, actually real time data that's being used a lot by like very many people 
you, you just, you're simply not gonna be able to do that anymore. Um, and so really the first step is like one, realizing that this is a problem that we don't wanna accept anymore, even though we've accepted it so far. Um, and two, actually, I think it's great news. There is a solution for this. Like this is why software was, software engineering was invented to solve exactly <laughs> these kind of problems. Like how awesome is that, right? We don't have Absolutely. to reinvent the wheel. We can, we can, you know, we can rely on sort of software engineering uh, that has been developed for the last 70 years and, and we can glean some of those learnings and, and implement them here. Like how, for me, it's like super exciting um, and can free up lots of data scientists and data engineers to focus on kind of core revenue generating activities, um, which honestly, like, you know, machines are never going to be able to do. And so, um, you know, let's, let's make it easier for data teams to just trust the data so they can actually use it. Yeah, it's it's another tool that that'll make our lives easier. So now now that we have this established, and for the audience watching, I'm just sharing the website montecarlodata.com/product. Uh, I'm looking at the platform's uh, page right now. If you could tell us more about this and how are you solving uh, this problem? To to me, it looks like it's it's a complete platform of sorts uh, based on the website. At least uh, that's that's how it appears, and uh, the things promised at the bottom are quite interesting it's it's a security first architecture uh, there's no code onboarding end-to-end -end observability and it scales with the data which also i think is, is very important so if you could just tell us more about the scene yeah absolutely um and so and thank you thank you for bringing that up uh for reference um so yeah you're right our our platform the best way to think of us is um you know just like just like a new relic wrap dynamics uh for an engineering team you can use Monte Carlo for your data. Um, and so, you know, we do a lot of the things are sort of, we, we, we kind of as a platform are oriented around sort of the philosophy and everything that we talked about to date. Um, we do think that whenever dealing with data um, uh, and, and, you know, security has to come first. Actually, you know, uh, both uh, my CTO and co-founder and very many of our folks in our engineering team have security backgrounds. Um, and so, you know, we, we believe in, in security from day one. Uh, there's probably nothing more important um, than, than that. Um, and so when you think about kind of how, you know, sort of in, in, in the diagram that you showed, um, you know, you can see sort of how we think about kind of end-to-end -end visibility, you know, connecting kind of to, you know, wh wherever your stack is, um, you know, without sort of modifying your pipeline or your existing um, solution. Um, you know, we think about sort of using machine learning models to automatically learn your environment and your data. Um, so that you can sort of know what needs to be monitored, um, but also gives you sort of flexibility to kind of set custom rules. Um, and sort of as you can see kind of in, in, that, in that page, um, we really sort of anchor around um, making it very easy to understand data, to basically, um, you know, see and understand visibility into the health of your data through our data observability engine, basically. Um, and so that, you know, obviously kind of, um, when you think about sort of any data observability platform, you need to think about sort of anomaly detection techniques that helps you, you know, when th know when things break. Um, you know, you want to minimize false positives, but taking into account, you know, not just individual metrics, but like a holistic view of your data and the potential impact of a particular issue. Um, you know, you want something that will help you identify kind of the key assets and dependencies um, in your in your data, because oftentimes, um, you know, data teams inherit legacy um, systems in which they're not always familiar uh, with kind of what was set up before. I see you laughing, but I'm going to start crying. <laughs> but, why, um, why are we using uh, Internet Explorer? Why are we using, uh, why are we storing <laughs> our code on, on a zip file? <laughs> exactly. That's right. Um, and so, you know, uh, actually having, you know, a way to kind of identify your key assets. That's something that, that I'm very excited about. Um, uh, you know, we, I think that going back to your point around like there is already data about what your key assets and, and we can actually, we can look at things like what is being used, what is being queried and what way to help you understand what are your, um, what are your sort of key, um, key data parts that you actually want to use. Um, and, you know, having all of this information at your fingertips basically means sort of three things. One, you are the first to know about data problems. You, you know, the sort of the, the nightmare situation where you are like, you're not aware about, not aware of changes in your data is not gonna happen anymore. You're gonna be, you're gonna know about this. Two, once you, once you have actually identified that there's a problem, 
um, helping surface information to you that helps you resolve in minutes, not in days or hours. So, or months actually. So one thing that we've, we've learned from, from working with our customers is that um, one, you know, even when there's sort of a, a problem, it may, it may take like months to resolve an issue to identify like what exactly was the root cause. Um, and we believe in a world where it shouldn't take you months, it should take you a few minutes. Um, you know, the, the tricky part of this is also like the longer the problem lingers, the harder it is to sort of fix the problem. Maybe you need to backfill more data, maybe you need to like, you know, the sort of the errors kind of pile on them on themselves. You're also prone to more compliance risks the longer that it's sort of lingering. Um, and so really being able to resolve problems as soon as possible. Um, sort of the, the second um, kind of thing that we focus on in our, in our platform. And then the third is um, actually sort of preventing data downtime from the, from, from the beginning. So, you know, by having this information at, the finger, at fingertips and using it as part of your operations, um, you know, I think we can, and we've seen this happen, um, uh, you can sort of dramatically reduce the rate of data downtime to begin with, um, which, which is sort of uh, magical. So uh, for, for people that are curious, how, how can they check out the project? Uh, there's, there's a waitlist page. Uh, any any link apart from that that you want to mention? Yeah, feel free to email me. I'm bar, B-A-R-R, at MonteCarloData.com. Um, so super easy. Uh, if you want to learn more, if you want to set up time to chat, I love chatting about all things data, um, whether so, so it's our platform or just generally kind of about data downtime. Um, something that, you know, I, I obviously am very passionate about and think about a ton. Um, and so, you know, yeah, f- feel free to sh- just shoot me an email. Um, again, it's bar, B-A-R-R at MonteCarloData.com. Super happy to, um, to connect, exchange ideas, share more, et cetera. M- Mention that the podcast sent you, you'll get a faster reply. <laughs> the what, sorry? Oh, yeah, exactly. Yes, mention that. The, please do. <laughs> <laughs> so zooming out a bit and talking about the company in general, uh, you just raised, uh, I think, a little while ago, $16 million uh, in your seed funding. Uh, how, how has that uh, helped you or what's what's the vision? What's the next vision for the company? And what uh, decided you to raise money? I being having worked in a startup, I learned that there's there's this huge question. It's quite a big question if you'd want to bootstrap your own company or if you'd want to raise come uh, raise some money. So, why did you do it? What's what's next? What's the next vision for you? Great question. And you know, I think um, what I've learned. So actually, before kind of starting the company, um, I also I spoke with sort of about fifty or so founders. Um, actually, to just ask them about their kind of entrepreneurial journey. Um, and, and you're right, there's so many different ways to doing this from bootstrapping to, fun, to you know, raising um, VC uh, uh, funding, they're just, and, you know, you know, and even somewhere in the middle, right? It's, it's not sort of a static thing. Um, I, I learned through that, that the entrepreneurial journey is very personal. Um, it really depends on kind of what your ambitions are, kind of what, you know, what, what kind of a company you want to build, what kind of a problem you want to build. Um, for us, you know, it was, it was pretty... Um, uh, uh, pretty clear kind of from, from day one, what kind of company we, we want to build. And, um, you know, I think, I think this is this, uh, as I mentioned, like maybe the top problem in the data industry. And I think this is one that's sort of critical to solve as soon as possible. And, um, you know, we, uh, um, uh, we're very excited about doing that, um, as soon as possible and making it easy as fast as possible for all data teams, honestly, like, um, I think any data team out there needs something, something like this, and, and we're just stoked to, to help solve this. Um, and so, um, yeah, we, we, we just announced sort of uh, our Series A raised of uh, 16 million um, led by Excel, participation from a number of very strong folks, including GGV um, and others. And um, yeah, we're, we're super fortunate to, to be working with them and you know, have, have largely used the funds to um, you know, hire, hire our awesome team um, uh, we have a great, um, uh, you know, um, stellar team of folks who are similarly sort of passionate about this. And, um, you know, we kind of wake up uh, obsessed about our customers and about helping them, you know, sort of wishing on wishing upon them no data downtime if possible. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, re- really looking forward to what's what's next from the team. Uh, another thing that I've learned through your journey is you really give a lot of importance to having di- a diverse team, having looking at culture uh, from importance uh, how, how do you think as uh, anyone in a startup not not just in a leader's role how, how should we what, what are we doing wrong and what, what should we do better to encourage 
diversity or helping uh, improve our cultures in general because it's it's a lingering problem i think yeah you know i think um maybe the most important thing that we can do is like wake up and think about it and talk about it and, and take action on it um and you're right anyone can do that you don't need to start a company to do that um and folks folks in in our company for example i'm seeing people sort of you know work to change our reality every day whether that's you know um you know thinking about the representation or participation of folks in the creation of our product in the in sort of our website um in sort of the events that we organize uh, and sort of the advisory boards that we put together um you know just thought about culture and diversity and inclu- and inclusivity inclusion um goes into every step of the way that we that we are building the company you know i, I can't tell you that that we're perfect we're, in fact we're very far from that um but we're working very hard to sort of you know be the change that we want to see in the world right um and you know i i personally think that some some of the ways to to kind of deal with that is by um you know creating more positive examples of of diversity and inclusion and that could be you know really in any industry um in particular i'm excited about the data industry because i think it can be it can help level the playing field um so i think the data industry has a great opportunity to to help um to help solve some of these um but you know i think um uh you know some of the some of the best ways to do that is to to create more and more positive examples and so we're working hard to to do exactly that if we can we we need more leaders like you we definitely need more such role models um i i know you've mentored uh before at a vc firm as well i i'm sure you might have some interesting take away takeaways from that but in general broadly speaking what's your best advice to someone who's just starting their entrepreneurial uh, journey who's just starting uh, they um my best advice is don't listen to any advice <laughs> i'm i'm only half joking that half joking when i say that i've actually found that you know for probably for any question that i have i can find like five people that will tell me one thing and then five people that will tell me the exact uh, opposite of that thing um and so you know i think i think uh advice is very important um but really kind of I guess um what I've learned at least for myself is that um you know we have a lot of reasons for like why not to start a company or why not to do something or um you know um there's just many reasons not to do things but um I think if you honestly just do it just like know that it's possible to do this have that confidence in you and you know sort of launch yourself into it go all in on it um uh I think you will learn the most and in the end you know the answer lies within you um and so kind of look look for the look for the why yes um and and lean into that and and the answers will make themselves obvious like like you said it's always a very personal journey yeah Why exactly so? very I, much so i have three more personal questions i try to keep the last question somewhat tricky uh, for the people i'm interviewing <laughs> i'll, I'll maybe start i'll maybe start with an easy one uh Why did you name the company Monte Carlo? I know it's named after the simulation. Why, why did you uh, name it after the simulation? Yeah, great question. Um, so uh, I actually, um, you know, I did I did sort of research at the stats department um, with Monte Carlo simulations, and um, yes, it's you know it's a Monte Carlo for folks who are maybe not familiar. It's sort of a way to um, you know predict an outcome in situations where we don't have an analytical mo- like a full analytical model of the problem. um but we can try to basically simulate the problem very many times over and over again um to try to see what the outcome uh might be um and maybe the best sort of application of that is actually um uh you know um uh many sort of forecasting ways or sort of forecasting uh platforms like 538 is an example they run 40,000 different simulations of the outcomes in different states um and by looking at those collective results they try to predict the overall outcome. Um and so, you know, applications of Monte Carlo sort of range all the way from kind of like elections to um poker uh to, you know, uh actually biology research. Um uh so that's, you know, I, I sort of exposed to that at at a at a kind of young age. Um and uh um you know, when sort of naming the company um wanted to sort of focus on a name that would both resonate with our audience. um but also would be very approachable 
um, and just found Monte Carlo to be one where, you know, for folks who sort of work with data, um, they're, you know, likely familiar with Monte Carlo simulations um, and maybe want to visit the Monte Carlo, um, you know, location. Uh, and so <laughs> just I'm actually that- jealous. I, I know you were flying people out for the grand how I missed that boat. <laughs> yeah, we're also a Formula One fan. So it was actually, um, uh, it's, you know, all sort of paths converge in Monte Carlo these days. <laughs> C- continuing to the next question. Uh, in your bio on the blog, it says you're a fan of action movies. What's your favorite action movie of all time? Oh, such a good <laughs> question. It's so hard. You have, you're forcing me to choose. Um, yeah, I, I'm a big fan. Some... Um, some specific ones. I really like the matrix. The first one, um, first, that's not probably... the third one. Sorry, not the third one. No, no, definitely okay. not. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing like the first one. Um, and I'm also a big fan of kind of all Bruce Willis movies. So any Bruce Mo- uh, Willis action movie, um, hit me up with it. But, um, uh, yeah, I'd say other than that, the matrix is probably my favorite. Okay. Uh, I think this might be tricky of the other two or not. I know you backpacked uh, for a few years, maybe one year or two. What was your favorite travel experience on that? Oh, great question. Um, so, you know, after um, kind of after my military service and um, before before going to Stanford, I spent almost a year backpacking um, actually throughout uh, throughout South America. Um and, and love that time. Um, it's really hard to choose one place in one location. Um, but I think just the experience of backpacking for a very long time um, is something that I just highly, highly recommend. Uh, there's something about sort of that, um, you know, immersing yourself in nature and, um, uh, and that sort of freedom to kind of really explore and look inwards is something that is just very cherished time. And you know, I try to keep that in my day to day today, um, even today, whether it's like meditating or spending a lot of time in, in nature. Um, so th- those are some of the things that are, are near and dear to my heart. Sounds like a lot of fun from an alternate world. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but before we end the interview, uh, if you could just mention the platforms where the people could connect to you, uh, connect with you. I know there's the website, uh, any other platforms apart from that? Yeah, so feel free to reach out um, either our website, MonteCarloData.com, um, either directly to me, bar, B-A-R-R, at MonteCarloData.com, or connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, would love to hear your sort of stories and perspective on data downtime um, or anything else in sort of the, the space. Uh, really looking forward to hearing from folks. For the lazy people who won't scroll down, uh, Bar's Twitter handle is her initials, BM underscore data downtime. Very easy to remember. So just feel free to find her <laughs> yeah. on Twitter. In case you were curious what I'm thinking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Bar, for, for such such an interesting conversation. This is one of the few uh, data-driven ones that we've had on the podcast. But thank, thanks for this insightful conversation. Absolutely. Thank you for having me and for the great questions. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.